Life's tough, but superheroes are tougher. A podcast about real-life superheroes in the entertainment industry with your host, Stephen Shane. This episode is brought to you by the Podcast Services Division at Life's Tough Media. Having your own podcast allows you to creatively reach all types of audiences, from clients to prospects, to your most loyal membership base. And by utilizing studio affiliates located around the world, coupled with quality remote recording capabilities, Life's Tough Media makes having a corporate podcast easier than ever before. Contact us for a no-obligation consultation at info at lifestuff.com or visit lifestuff.com to learn more. Welcome back, everybody, to part two of Life's Tough, Superheroes Are Tougher with Billy Martin. Uh, this interview, Alex, was so great. Yeah, uh, We didn't want to cut it. We didn't want to cut it short. Billy is sort of taking us on a journey, right, uh, from, from high school student to yep. rock star, yeah. rock icon. Uh, group very very tons, small time. Very tons small of time. hits. Yeah. Tons of hits. And then decides, you know what? I'm going to be a comic book artist too. Right. Uh, and I'm going to d- design toys and I'm going to do all these other great things. So it was such a great interview. We decided to make it two parts and not sort of cut it shorter. And we hope you enjoy it and uh, stay tuned and you'll see part two right now. So, um, so, so that's interesting. So, you know, again, you talked about your art and your style and, and I think your art lends itself to, to Ninja Turtles. I think that kind of, you know, that's kind of that, that style, some of the stuff that, that you've done over the years. Which characters do you think really lends itself to your style that you haven't had a chance to draw yet that you'd really like to seek, sink your teeth into? Hmm, that's a good question. Um, definitely like animation crossovers like that are cool. I mean, my like I've never really got to do Batman. And I know that's a DC thing and Batman is kind of gritty, but the 90s Batman animated series was like such a major, major influence on my artwork. I used to come home from school and sit in front of the TV with my sketchbook and just stare at the TV and try to like, copy the shapes and stuff so so i do think like doing batman in my style would be really really fun um i'm not really sure like what characters out there i would say that i haven't done um i mean i like a lot like tim burton is obviously you can tell behind me tim burton is really huge for me because tim burton is like weird and creepy and spooky but it's never like gory and uncomfortable scary you know like it's like like he family friendly Yes, but it's like it has a really nice like same with John and Vasquez work right. like Invader Zim and yeah. stuff was like such a big influence on me because it was weird and it was like creepy, but there was like like the tiny spit safe still like it never yeah. went too far to the point where you're like, oh, like like some horror stuff like I love scary horror stuff like I love a good scary movie, but Tim Burton was just so unique in that like he, he was able to pull all those elements from horror movies that people love, but you still felt like you were watching like a family friendly comedy at some point. So anything like that, I mean, I'd love to adapt any of his characters. You know, I know for a while IDW did an Edward Scissorhands book um, mm-hmm. and I was really jealous that I didn't get out. That would be really good, that. by the way. But, that would have been a good, know, that would have been a um, good Drew, the artist who did do it is so good and he was the perfect choice for them. And I get that, but um, you know, Beetlejuice, Edward Scissorhands, if they ever oh, did yeah. some kind of, you know, like a Nightmare Before Christmas comic or something like characters who are like really dear to my heart um you know i love star wars i can see alex by your room you might like star wars too. <laughs> just a little just a little bit just a little bit, a little bit. i think it's a obsessive lot of star wars <laughs> fan art yes hey star wars is the best you know i've done a lot of star wars fan art um but i've never been asked to do any kind of like professional star wars anything and um those characters are so classic that they lend themselves to any style you could do a really yeah. gritty star wars piece or a really cartoony star wars piece and you know who the character is like that so um i would certainly be really excited to do something you know like on a professional level with with star wars characters would be those would are be those are all good answers you know you said you weren't sure but those are all those yeah. those were all those were all good choices so, well, so let's, my gears were spinning faster than uh, i was talking like, come <laughs> on billy get good answers here so 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 your your music and your art is sort of an evolutionary process i will tell you that you know, the first time I really listened to your music was after I sort of had found out that, that you were in the band. I wasn't that familiar with it. And for me, I wasn't coming from it. You know, a lot of times people come from an elitist point of view where it's like, oh, you know, I, I so I, I liked all of the music. I wasn't judgmental at all. I was like, oh, this is just great music. And I would listen to it. And then I'd go to the concerts and then you would have new music come out and be like, oh, this is great. And like, to me, I loved the new stuff as much as I loved the old stuff. Obviously, you know, for musicians, you're always sort of balancing, right? The fans want to hear the hit songs, 
But like, like I said prior, you know, sometimes you have new fans, sometimes you have old fans, and you have this sort of balance between the evolutionary process of your band where you want to be able to move forward, right, and do new stuff and, and do new books and do new styles and do new everything. But yet you still have to balance it with, hey, Billy, we like your style. Don't change that. Um, so how does that sort of affect your approach to sort of um, you want to try new things, you want to do Batman, you want to do this one, you want to do that one. But yet, you know, are, are you locked into a style where they're like, oh, that's the style you do and you can't change that? Because like Alex and I have seen over the years, Jim Lee, Andy Kubert, John Romita Jr., like they've all evolved their styles, uh, just like your music has evolved over the years. So talk a little bit about balancing that act between the hit songs, the new songs, the, the, the hit art that you're doing and the new art that you want to do. Sure. It's funny, like you're finding all these parallels that I've never thought about that are actually very similar <laughs> in, in both of the things I do. Because yes, when you're writing a set list, absolutely, you've got to figure what are all the songs that are going to make the best crowd reaction? What are the songs you're going to want to hear? But I've been playing these songs for 20 years. What songs <laughs> are going to excite me? Like you, you, you'll see if the band's up there like, oh, this song again, you know, and then they're playing the new song and the band's like pumped, like, oh, this is a new song. So you really do have to find a balance there um, to to appease both crowds. And and there's going to be the people in the crowd, too, who are like, oh, I haven't seen Good Charlotte in 10 years. I'm so excited to go. I didn't even know they had a new record, but I'm going to go because I want to feel like I'm in high school again with my friends at the Good Charlotte show. And they're looking for a nostalgia experience, you know, and then you have the fans who like love your band from day one through now just the same. They, they know every word to every song and every record. And they're going to get the new record the day it comes out. You go to do a concert and somehow the record has been out for one day and they already know the words to all the new songs, <laughs> which is you know, and then so so there is definitely um you gotta split the difference a little bit. And sometimes as the tour goes on, you kind of are changing the set list from night to night because you think, hey, last night, last two nights, that old song like went over really, really well. Like that was crazy. We should do that one more often. Or sometimes you might just be like, So here's an old one. And some guy in the back of the round will be like, play something, you know, and mm -hmm you'll be like, man, everybody calls this song. Like, I didn't think that was an old song that anyone cared about, but we're always hearing people yell out, play this song. So maybe we add this one to the set or, you know, same thing with a new song. You think, man, like at the beginning of the tour and not that many people knew the new songs and we, the record has been out for two weeks. And now like people get really excited to hear the new songs because they know it. So maybe let's bring some more new songs into the set. So it's definitely a reactive thing. You need to pay attention to what, to the reactions you're getting and make sure that you're feeding into those. And same thing, like, sometimes I will spend three days working on like a, a really detailed piece with like a crazy background in it. And I'm, I'm trying some new techniques out. I'm like, All right, I'm gonna do like a more matte painted realistic background on this. And I'm gonna really like go crazy with my details and my highlights and you post it up on the internet. And you, if people are like, oh, this is cool, I like it. And the next day you throw up like a quick sketch or something and it gets like 10,000 likes. And you're like, <laughs> no, you know, like I spent 10 minutes on this and it's tripling the one that I spent three days on. And then I think, why? You know, in some reasons it's, it's the character you chose. Some characters just have a fan base that is undeniable. So, you know, if I were to do, you know, baby yoda sure like people are gonna go crazy for that character you know like but had i actually chosen to do like something more with like the ships or the background or something more detailed you, that's a much smaller audience like it's it's more detailed it's more like you feel like you put more time into it but like just a dumb little picture of grogu eating the frog or something people are gonna <laughs> lose their mind you know what i mean like that's 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 what they want so so yes i feel like you, you can develop your style and you can add new things to it. But if you're working in this kind of industry, especially people who go to the cons and they sell a lot of fan art and prints and commissions, like that's a big part of it is some people are going to those comic cons and they're going up in the aisle with like tunnel vision, like Deadpool, Deadpool, where's the Deadpool art? If you don't have Deadpool on your table, they stop looking, you know, and there's nothing you can do about that. Like if that's what they're looking for, then it is what it is. So do you only draw Deadpool because that's what you want to sell? Like, no, not necessarily. But if everyone at the convention is looking for Deadpool and you don't have any Deadpool, like put your spin on Deadpool. How could you do Deadpool different than somebody else did it? Like try to put your style on it and, and see what you can do. So there's definitely characters I've drawn. Like uh, when I first started doing Comic-Cons, it was like David Tennant, Doctor Who everywhere. And I yeah. was like, Doctor Who, like who? Yeah. Like for, like, I don't know who Doctor Who is. I've, I've heard of the name. I know it's like a telephone booth or something, I thought, you know, and then so I went on Netflix and I binged like two seasons of it just to like soak it in the character. 
and I did a Doctor Who print, but I did a really cartoony one. And so many people come up by my booth and be like, oh, I've never seen anyone draw a Doctor Who like this before. Like, oh, this is different. And you think like, okay, like it works. So I don't know if that's as much of development of style. I think that just comes naturally. Like your style is always going to develop. Your skills are going to get better. Like don't get stuck. Like, don't think, oh, this is how I draw. So I don't have to learn anymore. Like I'm always watching YouTube videos about new techniques in Photoshop or things. Like I'm always trying to up my skills, but I think a big part of maturing or learning is like paying attention to what's hot and like what's happening. And like, don't just do what's hot, but how can you take what's hot and like adapt it to what you're already doing and like put your own thing on it. And I think that's key. It's like staying current, like figuring out what trends are are happening and it's not always a trend of what characters taught but like if you're seeing a ton of people i don't know sometimes color palettes are really popular season to season like you'll see different colors and stuff like that that are really popular and uh sometimes you know it's you'll see some of the old school guys going tri- going digital because you're like okay well everyone's going digital that's like a look like you could stay with your pen and paper if that's what makes you happy but maybe let's try digital like let's let's try what's happening and i've even been messing around with blender a little bit and trying to learn a little bit of like 3d art and stuff because there's so much going on um with computers and so much stuff and i thought like drawing with a cintiq in photoshop was like super current but that's like dinosaur stuff now you know now now everyone's like molding and modeling and everything's gone 3d and i think okay if i don't at least have somewhat of a knowledge of what's going on in that like i'm gonna get lost so i think that that's that's part of the learning by the way i think you answered that question pretty extensively because you know at first i talk a lot if you haven't figured that uh, no, 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 but I'm saying that that's a good answer because stop. So at, at at first you were weren't really sure about what what the evolution was, but then you're you're bringing all these new elements. I will tell you that when you did the Casey Jones commission for me at the show that Stephen Amell was at, you used sort of like a brown paper. Yes, um, exactly right, and that was something new. I hadn't really done much. Right, but. I, I hadn't seen that before. So, but I so other artists at Comic Con season. I was like, ooh, the toned paper when you put the white ink on it. Yeah. it's really cool. Like I gotta try that. So simple things like that. You, it might not be so much as changing your style, but your tools or your palette are just little things here and there. Try try things out and see what happens. To, to me, the most drastic change, Alex, and I don't know if you remember this, and, and Billy, I don't know if, if you were reading Batman back then, but Andy Kubert had left. Uh, I'm sorry, Adam Kubert had left. They both did had left Marvel and went to go work for DC. And the first book he was working on, I believe was Batman. I can't remember if it was Batman or Superman. And I remember almost immediately he put out that toned paper and I saw him using like chalk. I saw him using like all different sorts of tools uh, that he had never used before. And I remember seeing him at a show and I said, Adam, I said, what's going on? He goes, you know, he said, now that I'm working for DC, he goes, I didn't want it to just be a DC version of my Marvel stuff, right? He wanted to do something completely different. I said, did DC sign up for that? You're like, you know what I'm saying? Cause like, maybe that's what they bought. That's what they hired you for, yeah. right? Like, you don't know, they hired you for something. And, uh, but it went over really, really well. I mean, it was something that you didn't even know Adam could do in that style. But it's and really smart sudden, of him to think like a whole like aesthetic tonal shift to something totally new, different. you know, like, and, and that's, that's really smart. And that's- if, that's why the greats stand out, you know? If, if you look at Adam's final work at Marvel at that time and his new work at DC, it looks completely different. And the story that I tell all the time when it comes to music, um, one of the most moving shows for me was seeing Paul McCartney at Yankee Stadium. And what's funny is, is he had a live at Yankee Stadium album that had come out years ago. And I, there were 22 songs on it. The night that I had seen him, uh, he played 21 of the 22 songs that were on the album. And I've listened to that album a thousand times. But when right. you're in Yankee Stadium with 55,000 people singing uh, Hey Jude, it's almost like a religious experience. And I've been to hundreds and hundreds of musical concerts, maybe over a thousand music shows in my life. And it's almost like a religious experience. And you say to yourself, that's why he's Paul McCartney. That's For why sure. he's 75 years old and sells out Yankee Stadium. Because when you hear 55,000 people singing Hey Jude, you almost want to cry. Yeah. Right. It, it's like a very moving uh, religious experience there. So, um, and this, so but the song had to be there in the first place. You know what I mean? Hundred percent. Other experience doesn't happen, and that's just talent. You know, I mean, hundred percent. But it, it leads me to like that's how you get that longevity, right? Because you yeah. had said the guys that mail in. I've been to plenty of concerts where where the artist is on the stage, and it looks like it's the last place they want to be, and the last yeah, song they the want to be playing. Right. And, you know, you have to have a sort of a large sample size. And then when you when you go to a Bruce Springsteen concert, when, when I've been to your concerts, 
And I've been to a lot of them and the fans are into it. Like they're into it the whole time. You say yourself, like, that's why these guys have been around for 20 years. I mean, you guys have been around for 20 years. There's so many bands that are like in and out artists that are in and out illustrators that are in and out because they just, they don't have it. Like they, they have it for that. They hit that one note that one time. And then that's it. They don't, they don't hit anything ever. Evolve again. or die. Right. Evolve and then X-Men, or die, you know? X-Men and I think tagline like, at some point. <laughs> it's so true. Some people are yeah. kind of just lazy too. Yeah. You know, like yeah. it's not going to be easy the whole time. <laughs> I always say it's easier to get in than to last. You know what yeah. I mean? Like it's way right. easier to get that one song and that one first opportunity it's like longevity is way harder than breaking in yes yes so so to, to, to close out the night billy let's talk about anything you got upcoming i think you're working on some toys or something like that yeah that's what mostly i've been doing and and for most of 2020 you know since i've just been home like most of us uh has been a lot of um hasbro marvel stuff which has been really cool I, of course i can't really talk about any of it i don't think anything i've done has come out yet um, but I've, man, I've, I've probably done a good, like 50 plus different, like 50 figure. Wow. Yeah. You know, that, 50. Like, yeah, we've, we've been doing a lot. It's been really awesome. Um, they've been awesome to work with. Um, and it's cool because I think of myself more as like a character designer than a comic book artist. Like I love to draw characters, like backgrounds and like cityscapes and cars and stuff. That's like a little more of a headache for me. Like I can do it. Cause I feel like anything I can't draw, if I force myself to learn it, it's just like another like tool in the toolbox kind of thing. So I would learn it, but I'm much more comfortable drawing characters. That's just what I like to do. So with Hasbro, it's just all action figures and characters. I don't have to worry about what the background looks like. I don't have to do like some weird talking pose where it's behind the guy's shoulder. Cause most of the time when you draw comics, you think, oh, I can draw until you get the script. And it's like, first thing is behind the guy's back. And you're like, I don't draw backs. I just draw guys doing this, you know, like, but with comics, you have to be able to draw anything. Like there's, there's, so, so it was a nice, you know, breath of fresh air to be like, just draw this character, like doing this or like come up with a cool concept of this character, you know, in this position doing this or something. So that, that was really nice. Um, just change of pace. Done a, awesome. a little bit of comic, comic work. Let's see. I did like um, a zombie variant power pack for Marvel at the beginning Ooh. of 2020. That was sort yeah, of the last cool. Marvel thing I did. Um, like, uh, and then I did like recently a Usagi Ojimbo for IDW uh, oh, variant awesome. for that. And that was pretty cool. But for the most part, it's it's been quiet. And the, the thing I attribute to it is most of my comic book works comes at the shows. Like I meet editors or publishers I at the that. shows and they'll come by my booth at like, I swear, like New York and San Diego, like that sets up my work for like the rest of the year kind of thing. You know, like you meet people there and then that's how the work comes. And even at Ace, you know, like there's you guys will have publishers from you know like boom and like idw and like some of the other like decent you know like bigger indie comics companies are there and they're walking around looking for new talent and um i think man why am i not getting any work right now i'm like oh because i'm not doing comic cons like they really right. kind of go hand in hand like the whole industry has slowed down very much so um i'm i'm looking forward to getting back to them you know and in getting back to, to doing some more comic stuff and back to comic cons and seeing you guys, you know, like I think it would at least like once a month for like a couple of years. Know. Yeah. Each other, you know? And it's been it's a crazy, long time. Right? So this, you were on tour. You were on tour with us basically. Uh, exactly. You know, like I, <laughs> I, tour it, it, when I don't tour. So it, it's funny. You brought up the perspective thing. Cause I, I do remember years ago, John Ramita jr. Taught a class at one of our wizard shows called perspective. And I remember him handing out a script and everyone was like an aspiring artist. And they thought it was going to be easy peasy. Like you are, right? It's, oh, how hard? And it's like the opening scene is uh, you're looking through the window from across the street and you see Mary Jane and Spider-Man having a conversation. And it's like, holy shit. How, oh, how do you, I, I can't say that. Like, how do you draw that, right? Like you're looking in the window from across and everyone's like, uh, okay, this is not going to be as easy as we thought it was going to be, right? Like, what like he was teaching perspective like can For you sure. draw that view then can you draw from the upper corner looking down on them like then now now i want you to zoom into the room and i want you to go into the upper right corner of the room and look down on the two of them ta having the same conversation in the next panel and then you have to start drawing that panel by panel by panel over 24 pages that is not easy same clothes draw. same background right. stuff right. The, same tv the funniest thing is the very first comic I did, like full series, was my own creator own book, this a book called Vitrio the Hunter. It's like a futuristic vampire story. And, and that was through IDW. And I wrote it with my brother-in-law, um, my wife's sister's husband. So he, he's like always been into script writing and he's really talented in the 
writing and so we were like hey let's do this book together so we wrote the script together and i'd sit down and start writing it and then i'd get to a scene i'd be like i'd, I'd call him can we change this page because i cannot draw this you know like, <laughs> like, have, the, have the character do something different That's because funny. this is way too hard to draw so we amended a ton of panels in the story because i was like i can't draw this you know and it's my your whole life you think like yeah i can draw but drawing comics is so different so then when i first started working on ninja turtles for idw I would get scripts from other writers who I'd never met before. They would just send me the script and be like, right, right, right. like I can't change anything. And one <laughs> of them, they're running through the this subway, New York City subway. And what do you call the things that you turn when you put the ticket through? The turn style. Through? Yeah, turn okay, style. But he, gave, he called it something different. I can't remember what he called it. I can't, but the writer was yeah. just like, so they're running through and they're jumping over that. And I'm thinking, okay it's like a couple bars with some spinny things and i'm drawing these like looking like ice cream sticks with like <laughs> pop. i'm like so then i started referencing on looking on mine was one of those look like i'm like oh, there's so much more to it and then's when i just realized like man comic book art it is so much work and that was one little panel one out of panel. like a whole 18 pages or something like that and it must have spent me two days like looking up how do i draw these underground subway things you know i remember when the, the thing was over and the yeah, I believe it was um, Paul Aller was the writer. And yeah, I think you've had Paul at a couple of your shows. Um, he wrote a bunch of mine. And then Caleb Goelner, who I've sat next to in New York Comic Con for years. And me and Caleb have become really close over the years. And I'm pretty sure I was sitting there at one of the Comic Cons being like, oh, yeah, by the way, this page, that really sucked. You know, you need to think about your artists when you're writing this. <laughs> right, you know? that's funny. Writers that's don't think funny. about that. They're just like <laughs> writing it. Whatever comes out of there, like all the artists can figure it out. So, you know, the guys who pump out 24 pages plus a cover on a monthly right. basis at such a high level like nothing but insane respect for those guys like you know some people who just just they're they're powerhouses like it's just like ingrained in them so you know that's no that's great that's great by the way how, how did the how did the, how did the uh, how, how did the hasbro a collab come about So Hasbro came up with uh, my friend, Derek Lofman. I don't know if you guys know Derek. He's um, a Canadian based artist. He does a lot of his own work. He did like the, the Marvel mini superhero like animated thing. So there's mm -hmm, like the, mm -hmm. they look like the small sort of chibis. Um, and um, Derek's been a good friend of mine for years. He's been really helpful. One of those artists for when I'm stuck on something, I'll, I'll send it to Derek, Derek, what can I can't see? And he's like, oh, I'll just flip it this way and turn the hand. And I'm like, oh my gosh, how did I not see that? That's perfect. <laughs> right. So. Derek's really smart um, and he was doing a lot with Hasbro and I kept I was like man I wish I could do some stuff with Hasbro and most artists would be mm -hmm. like yeah you're not taking my job like I already have that job and a lot of artists don't want to like make the intro because they think well then if he gets the job then I can't have the job too and I get that it's a little bit like you can't take my job but Derek was like oh I'll introduce you like he wrote the Hasbro guys like oh it's my my friend Billy he's a great artist let me know if you need anything and they were like oh thanks Billy your work's great like you gotta like right like that they started I mean, he did the same thing um with tops tops digital cards oh, I, nice. I have they haven't come out yet but i did a whole set for uh for like the tops marvel like digital trading cards same oh, thing awesome. like this is my friend billy he you know he does some good work and they're like we'd love to have you so uh it's really cool and another artist can can look out for you like that and not be awesome. scared of oh is he gonna take my job but no you're just helping your friend out so yeah so shout out to derek he, he's he's hooked me up and put me in the right place a lot of times over the last awesome. couple of years yeah B billy it's not a zero-sum game we see that all the time there's enough yeah. projects to go around and if you do good work they'll invent a project for you right so that's true. that's just the way it goes so well true. thank you for thank you for joining us tonight this was very informational this was oh, great Great interview. Great having you. And we hope to see you in person soon. And, and thanks again for joining us tonight. Yeah, no but problem. it was great. I hope that too, man. Really great to see you guys. And best of luck with the podcast. All right. Thank you. Thank you.